Welcome to Clean Your Data, um, Getting Started with OpenRefine. Uh, I'm Evan Williamson. I'm called the Digital Infrastructure Librarian. Uh, I kind of coordinate the workshops here, and um, I love OpenRefine, so that's why I like to teach it. And I try to come up with stuff to do with it every day, but um, in fact, I don't have that much to do with it every day. But it is an awesome and fun program to use. It's much more fun than Excel, and I hope you will enjoy it. So the, I have this website up. Um, and we're just going to kind of go through that rather than having some slides and that'll make it easier so you can like click through to all the various links and copy and paste things if you want to during the demo. But first we're just going to do a real quick kind of intro to OpenRefine so you can kind of understand the use cases and, and, and why it's so awesome. Um, and if you have questions, you know, just uh, of course go ahead and um, let me know at any point and we can uh, uh, do that. And uh, online, you know, remember to give me the chat and I'll remember to try to check in uh, often. Um, so, uh, anything before we get started, guys? Did, did you guys have the website to click on to? Did everybody find it? One thing I noticed is the screen is good for like pointing out stuff, but it's not necessarily good for reading from the distance. So, um, I like to have it right in front of me. All right, so let's get started with um, learning about OpenRefine. So, what is uh, OpenRefine? And actually, let's send this, make this a little tiny bit bigger. All right. Uh, so um, David Hugh, um, who's one of the original developers for OpenRefine, uh, he says it's a power tool for working with messy data. And um, it's more powerful than a spreadsheet. It's more interactive than visual and visual than scripting. And it's more provisional, exploratory, and experimental, and playful than a database. So it sounds really fun, and it is. Uh, so originally, OpenRefine was developed by Google as Google Refine, and it was supposed to be a kind of data tool that they um, uh, that they developed. And then, at a certain point, Google's funding for that project ran out, and so it was transitioned to an open source project. So now, um, it's called OpenRefine rather than Google Refine. But you're going to find a lot of tutorials that still call it uh, Google Refine, and um, a lot of materials and stuff. And they're they're the same thing, um, and either one is going to work um, when you're looking for advice. So um, what does he mean by, let's take a look at that again, I guess. Uh, what does he mean about more powerful than a spreadsheet? Well, there's a lot more functionality in this than there is in, say, Excel or um, uh, LibreOffice. Uh, you can do a lot of things that you could normally would have to use Python or R to do uh, manipulations and transformations of data. So it's a lot more powerful than using Excel. Um, why is it, it's more interactive and uh, visual than scripting. So. A lot of this kind of stuff I'll do with um, Python and maybe like the pandas pack, uh, uh, packages and a lot of people do that and for a lot of use cases that's a, a good way to do it. But OpenRefine is visual and it's interactive so you have this kind of ability to actually just kind of explore that data without um, knowing what you want in advance. So when you're writing a Python program you're probably going to have to you know kind of have a good idea of what you want as an end product. Um, which is not always the case when you're just opening up a data set and trying to explore the bits and pieces of it and try to evaluate how good it is and how bad it is. So it, it's more interactive. Um, and you can see what you're doing while you're working with it. And then um, the same kind of thing applies, uh, basically what I said, to the database. You know, you can get all kinds of different um, views out of the database, but you kind of really need to know what you're searching for in the database before um, to get out what you want. Um, OpenRefine is really great at just being able to open something up um, get a good sense of what's in there and um, explore it uh, without really knowing anything about it. So it's going to look something like that. We're going to jump right into that in just a few minutes. And um, I'm just going to say it's a uh, free, um, open source, extensible Java app that runs offline in your web browser. So what does that mean, uh, free and open source? Um, free doesn't mean just that it doesn't cost anything. That's part of it. It doesn't cost anything. But free is also um, open source. That the source code is there. You can change it. You can modify it. And that um, builds into this extensible um, quality. So uh, people can add on things to this program. And a lot of people have made different spins for it that have like um, a uh, open data, a linked open data version that has very modifications that make it work with certain types of data sets. There was a um, genomics one that was created as well. And then people can build little plugins that add on to functionality to it as well. And so that's very popular. And then it's a Java application. So it's going to run basically a little server on your computer. And it's going to serve up that application into your web browser. So you're going to interact with it in your browser. But it's not actually online. There's nothing. It's not connecting to the outside world at all. It is on your computer. And it's only local. So you're not going to um, put any of your data at risk. 
or you don't need an internet connection as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, as I said, it was originally developed by Google. So I put these links on here just for fun. They kind of had these trailers that they made um, that can give you kind of a, a exciting, you know, let's go do this kind of thing um, about Google Refine. And so if you want to have something visual on your board uh, on a break or something, you can watch those. Um, and we can handle all kinds of data with Google Refine or Open Refine. Um, but basically, it's going to um, represent it in our very familiar format that, you know, tabular data. So once you get it in there, it's going to be um, tabular data. And these are the kind of terms that it uses, because there's a lot of different terms that are used depending on your discipline. But um, over here, uh, going across the tabular data is are called a row in Refine. Um, going down uh, a whole um, column is called a column in OpenRefine. And then each individual little part of data is called a cell in OpenRefine. So it can import all kinds of different formats. It's really flexible uh, in those terms. So you can um, do all the different, you know, standard text type uh, data formats that would normally re represent it as a table. So uh, uh, tab delimited, um, comma delimited, and then you could also just have it delimited with any arbitrary delimiter that you choose. You can also do Excel, um, XML, JSON, which aren't, uh, and XML and JSON a lot of times are not, you know, it's not really tabular data, but it'll be able to convert it uh, in its import. It can import directly from Google Sheets and also RDF data. So um, the other thing that's flexible about it is that uh, those are the formats. You can also get those, um, those files from all kinds of different places. So on your own computer, you can get them from a uh, website, a URL. You can paste, cut and paste it in there. You can get them from, you can connect it with your Google Drive and get the, the, the data out of there. And then um, it'll also automatically be able to open a zip archive. So a lot of times you'll have uh, an export from your, um, your data logger or something that's just a zip archive of hundreds of little um, text files. You can just open that directly with Refine, which is really handy for a lot of cases. Or uh, just a whole directory of files. So you don't have to just limit yourself to opening one file at a time. Um, and a lot of times you'll have, say, a whole set of files that are the same, um, same columns. Uh, but you want to use them all as one file and normally you would have to go and do a bunch of cut and pasting to put them all together Open Refine just lets you open it all at once as a batch. So that's really uh, pretty handy and it'll have really good performance up to about a hundred thousand in the, in the hundreds of thousands of rows You're gonna have good performance um, once you get above that um, it'll start to bog down um, on some kind of operations um, But you can do some tweaks to your Java settings to make it actually work at millions of rows and there's actually some versions of it that people have created to work in parallel processing with like uh, uh, Spark servers and stuff like that if you want to get really complicated and do big data with it um, So I've kind of covered a bit of this but the use cases um, the Typical use cases are uh, to go ahead and clean your data um, You get a discover and you're gonna fix inconsistencies using the standard features fastening clustering transformations you're gonna transform your data. You have your data in one form. You need to reshape it to um, put it into some other, in, into Tableau, or you wanna reshape it and put it into Python just because it's easier to use, or um, sometimes you wanna change the format um, from uh, CSV into some kind of JSON with um, some changes on the way. And so um, it lets you do that in a real easy and um, visual way. Um, you can extend your data because it can actually uh, reach out to URLs um, you can collect data, you can scrape the web, you can um, uh, reconcile with online databases, um, you could geocode, things like that, so it's very good for enriching your data. And you can automate, because um, you can, everything that you're gonna do with Eurofine is gonna be recorded as a routine. And you're gonna be able to grab that, that history and reapply it to new data sets um, as you go forward. So that's really a powerful thing um, if you're doing a lot of processing. All right, so we already saw about, um, so what's messy data? This is kind of what we're talking about. And um, so the first, these top rows here, this is kind of, uh, you know, I work in text a lot, so my examples are gonna be kind of text, but um, the same kind of problems uh, apply to any, you know, bio data or any other kind of data that you're working with. Um, so in these top rows, all of the values are exactly the same, essentially to a human, but to a computer and to your, uh, your processing, um, these are all 100% different values, but they should be recognized by the computer as the same. So we need to fix that um, inconsistency 
and format issues if we want to do analysis with this. Otherwise, we're going to end up with bad results. So in here we have a date column um, with all different formats of this date, um, which I think was the last time I gave this workshop, which was October 2015. Um, does anyone recognize like what, what's, this, what's this date right here? So that's, that's actually how Excel stores dates. So if you're looking at an Excel sheet and there's dates, and then you actually look at the, the code underneath, um, it's storing them from like number of days since 1972 or some random thing like that. So um, if you are working with Excel, it does a lot of weird things in the background and um, then you pull it into some other program and you're like, why are all my dates like weird numbers? And that's why. And so that's actually October 4th, uh, 19 or 2015. So uh, each one of these dates uh, for your analysis is going to be look different, although they're all actually the same date. We need to try to wrangle those into a common format. Um, over here, we have some kind of uh, column of uh, $1,000, but you have all the different formats that, that people have added, um, and they're going to end up with being unable to really do any transformations with this data because this is like a string. Um, this is like a number. Uh, you know, some of these other representations, this might be represented as a, as a dollar value in Excel. And then over here we have Idaho, where there's a number of different little um, errors and inconsistencies that make it impossible for um, it all to be identified as just Idaho, um, all the same thing. Um, just even a spelling error, uh, which you can easily overlook as a human being, but you can't overlook as a computer. And then this final um, example down here, I have the, a kind of a reference to a book that we have in the library about OpenRefine. Um, and what this, this is a common thing that you'll find in a lot of data sets where this is actually a whole bunch of different um, values, but they're all in the same cell. So in this case, you really have uh, like a title right here, and you have like some authors, and then you have a date. And if you want to do um, some visualization, you want to do some tra uh, transformations, you want to fix up those, those uh, author names and stuff like that, you need to have those all separated out into individual cells so that you can work with them. And so OpenRefine is going to give us easy ways to deal with all of those types of issues. Uh, questions about the introduction? Or Refine, where we're going with this? OK, so now we're going to start doing it. Um, So I think everybody kind of got it installed. Um, did you did you get downloaded? I got it downloaded. Okay. Yeah, you don't. It doesn't really have to be installed. Um, it's it's a Java application, so it's uh, you're just going to unpack it in a location. Um, you need Java if you don't have Java. If you are installing Java, make sure that you uncheck the recommended option to replace your um, browser defaults, uh, and then. The one confusing thing for a lot of people is that there's a whole bunch of different uh, versions of it available. Um, there's a new one that actually just came out uh, a couple days ago. And I would, I would work with uh, 2.6 RC2, which is the one version back. I know that that one works. I was playing around with the newer version, and I think there's some things that are fixed, and there might be a few bugs that they'll fix in the next release. So um, there's a lot of versions. Most of them work, and most of them are stable. So just, uh, I would choose the one back. Um, all you have to do is unzip it. There's some issues with Mac, and um, then you're gonna start it by going into that directory where you um, unzipped it. On Windows, you're just gonna click on the file, uh, openrefine.exe. Uh, um, and so I'm gonna do it right here. So you go actually go into the directory, double click on the um, dot, exe and it should start up and what it's going to start up is actually this little terminal window right here and so that little terminal window is actually where the Java application is running and you can totally ignore it it has nothing to, that you need to do with it but you can't close it because that's where the little server is running um, once it, that starts up you're just going to like close it down and minimize it so it doesn't bother you and then what I've done is gone ahead and just pinned that onto my taskbar so it's really easy to start up in the future without having to go search for um, open or find later on because it doesn't actually install. It's not a program that you can install on your system. Um, it should automatically uh, open up a browser window with your um, uh, with your your new refine um, project. Let's check the chat since I, I didn't do that even though I said I would. All right, looks good. Um, 
and this is OpenRefine in the browser. Um, so, um, as I said, this is totally offline. You're not um, sending anything over the internet. You don't need an internet, connect internet connection to be running this. This is just the interface, and it's running out of this little um, terminal window that you have running in the background. Um, yeah? So it opened up in the browser, but my terminal um, you can't see your terminal, but it's. No, is it, I have my terminal. Oh. Uh, it's running Jupyter Notebook. Oh, okay. Um, well, wait. So do you have a. Do you got the interface? Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then I should talk to you. Okay. They probably just hide themselves somewhere. Okay. Okay. So you have okay. Assuming it works, then um, we'll just say that's good. <laughs> uh, what else are we going to do here? Okay. So the one other thing that you got to know. Um, Uh, is to close it, all you have to do is go ahead and close that browser window. It's still going to run in the background on this. And so if you want to, you can either just X out of it, but if you want to um, take the most care and make sure that it's saving your data properly, um, go into this browser window and do a control C to actually shut it down. Um, but in 99.5% of cases that it doesn't make a difference if you just X out of it or if you control C out of it. But uh, if you have a big data set that you want to make sure that it saved what you did, um, control C out of it. So you just close the browser window and then close the terminal window to get out. All right. Uh, whoop, sorry. All right, everybody um, online, do you guys uh, have any problems getting it uh, started, installed, and um, running? I'll take that as a no. So we're going to start in on the demo. Um, I kind of put this outline on the on this page um, that we will, oh, there's some chat. There we go. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thank you. Um, what you've got to do to start the demo is um, grab this data set right here. I'm going to do that because I don't think I, can't remember if I did. And, um, Oop, you got to move out of the way so I can close you. All right. So we're going to download this little um, university data.csv. And what this, this data set represents is um, somebody went on to Wikipedia and did a web scrape of all of these university pages to try to get data about their endowments. And so because it's a web scrape and because it's Wikipedia and every there's not a standard format, um, it's going to be a very dirty um, data set that we can just play around with. Uh, I'm, we're not going to really get anywhere with cleaning it up, but we're just going to use it as raw material to show you some of the features of Refine. Um, there's a lot of uh, examples out there, and I put those in the resources. And so if, you, you know, if you're from a particular um, department, or you know, there's lots of different use cases, you might check out the resources to see kind of um, an example that applies more closely to what you do. And there's a lot of help out there um, if you search for OpenRefine and Google Refine. Um, there's tutorials and there's a lot of uh, you know, comments and chats about everything that you could possibly do. So um, there's a lot of help out there uh, if you search. And um, this little data set was originally from a tutorial uh, from a group in uh, the Netherlands. And so just a citation there. OK. So. Um, I put my notes on here. You guys can, this outline is going to be very basic. You're not going to really be able to follow it, but the purpose of putting it up there was really so that you could, um, if you get lost, you can kind of remember what we were doing and you can like copy some of these uh, little formulas out if you want. Um, okay, so this is the opener fine interface. As you can see, this is when we start up. This is how you're going to create a project, open a project, import projects, and other kind of settings. Um, we're going to start out by creating a project. And so you're going to hit that create a project tab if that's not where you were. Um, it's going to save. Uh, when the, one of the really great features about Refine is that it never changes that original data that you're going to give it. Um, when you give it a file, it's just making a copy of it, and then it's changing it into its own unique format, which it, which it puts into an archive um, in its directory. So um, all the projects that I've worked on in the past are here. They've been 
imported in and they're accessible. So the things that you've done are saved in there and you can go back and, and work with them again if you want. But it's important to note that it, it will not change that original file, which is something that Excel always does every time you open a file. And so that's a real problem that you should be aware of when you're using Excel. Um, so we're going to create a project. We're going to go here to um, get the data from this computer. As I, I mentioned, that it's really flexible and that it can get data from all kinds of different areas, and those are how you do it. We're going to get one from our local computer, and I'm just going to choose it, the file that I just downloaded two seconds ago, and then you say next. Um, it says uploading data. Obviously, it's not uploading it anywhere. It's just getting it into the Refine um, app. Um, and it's going to give you this preview of what it, its first parsing option, what it feels like it should do. Sometimes that's wrong. 90% of the time, it's correct. Um, you can go over here, and you can actually change the character encoding. That's really important to do if you're working um, on Windows. And most of your text-based uh, files are actually going to be in UTF-8, which Windows and with, which Excel does not handle well at all. So that's another really good feature. Um, and you can go ahead and just click it to UTF-8. Um, and then you have all kinds of different options that you can change up how it's parsing that file. And you can actually change uh, the file type that it's automatically detected, um, change it to a different kind of file type if, if there's something weird about this file that it's not figuring out. Um, right here is an important one. Um, it says parse the next one line as a column header. And obviously you can turn that on and off if there's not column headers in your file. In this case, there is, so we're going to leave that on, and you can see that it's made headers up there on top of the columns. And then we're going to go over here to this project name. Um, I always go ahead and change that to um, something meaningful, since uh, it's just help, helpful to remember what you're doing. So I'm just going to change it to um, University Dad 2017. I'll even get fancy and put in the whole date of today. Um, and then you're going to create the project. So you're going to say create project. And it's going to take a minute because what it does now is makes a copy of that into this new, um, this open refined data format, um, which is different than, uh, it's not a CSV. It's, it's a kind of archive file that allows it to do a lot of the functions that it's going to do in a quick and efficient manner. So now you're, you're seeing your representation. And this is the base um, interface for open refined. And you're seeing a representation of tabular data kind of like um, any other kind of spreadsheet. You have some options up here of how many rows you want to show. Because a lot of cases, let's say you have um, really complicated data, you're going to not want to have very many rows showing. So you only kind of have an example of like five showing. We can do 25 if we actually want to look a little bit more closely at this. And the idea is um, you're, you're going to be doing operations on columns almost exclusively. And so you're really having a high level view of this data set rather than doing like data entry cell by cell. And so you're just kind of getting a preview by um, showing rows up there. But you can go ahead and navigate through the whole data set if you want using um, these next features. And it just gives you a preview of what's in here. Um, up here has got the name. You can actually change the name up there if you want. And you also can you know, open, export, all these kind of options that we're going to explore in a, in a minute. Um, so let's start by, let's see what I said we're going to start by doing. OK. So we're going to just start by giving you the, really, the basic things that um, that Refine does. Um, so if we, as I said, we're actually going to be working um, basically up and down columns. And so each column has a little menu. So if you see the little arrow um, there, you click on that arrow, and that's going to give you the menu uh, for that column. And they're all the same. But that's all of the things that you can do to that column. And, um, and so we're going to start by doing a text filter. Uh, not an endowment, though. Sorry. Uh, so do a text filter on the university. Text filter. And now um, let's just see it, how many Idaho um, universities there are. So you always want to have a sanity check by checking what that number of rows is at the top when we first imported it. And just keep that in your head because you're going to start doing things and you're going to see what happens. Um, and you want to make sure that you aren't getting unexpected results. So um, right now we have 75,000 uh, rows and uh, 75,043 rows. So let's just say Idaho and this, oh, misspelled Idaho. Continue to misspell Idaho. Okay, so now I filtered it, um, which is exactly kind of how you would expect. It's just going to search through there, and it's going to see if the item that you put in there is in um, that cell value. And it's going to give you only those rows 
um, that include that, uh, that, uh, that string. Um, so in this case, we said Idaho. So now we have 29 rows that relate to Idaho. Um, so now let's take a look at, well, what exactly are those 29 rows? Which Idaho universities are represented? So let's go back to that university um, column. Let's go over to facet, and let's say text facet. My mouse is a little bit dangerous right here. But, um, so faceting is like one of the most important and really powerful um, features of uh, OpenRefine. And so what it does is it just goes through that column um, of the, the rows that we've selected, and it gives you, it combines the ones that are the same. So right now, once you get that facet on university, we filtered it by Idaho, and now we have a facet on the university column. And so it's showing me exactly which values are present in there. And so right now we have one College of Idaho, we have 24 Idaho State University, and we have four um, University of Idaho columns, or uh, values. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then if we just delete this text filter, see what happens. Um, all of a sudden it goes back to this is all of the unfiltered um, universities. So this is all the universities that are represented in this data set. And we can sort these by um, count. So the most that we have in the data set is uh, Pennsylvania State University with 8,960 um, values in, that, in, this set, in this data set, and, and so on and so forth. And so we can go down and see what else is in here. And so it's just a very quick and easy way to just explore you know, what's here, you know, what is in this um, column. Um, and it's unlike you know, rolling through uh, the whole spreadsheet. Because if you want and try to scroll through 75,000, um, you're not really going to be able to keep in your head you know, how many of these are Idaho State, how many of these are Pennsylvania State. So this just gives you a way to kind of summarize that data set and explore it really quickly. So we can go ahead and start making some edits um, to the cells. And so the first way you can do that is you can just go over in here and make an edit. So I'm going to go over here and you see that there's like a little, let's cancel that for a second. Um, as I hover in that cell, suddenly a little thing that says edit comes up. And I can click on that edit and I can just change it manually. So that would just be basically like using Excel or, a spreadsheet or a Google Docs or something like that. I just by hand changed one single cell in our whole data set. Okay. Um, or I could go over here to um, these facets that I have, and if you hover on one, you're going to see that you can edit those all together as a single batch. So now I'm going to do um, University of Michigan. I said edit that facet over on the um, left-hand side, um, and I'm changing it, and let's see what happens. Say apply, and all of a sudden, I've just edited 5,184 cells in 22 milliseconds or whatever. So that's pretty great. It's a really powerful feature. You can make some um, quick changes and uh, clean up just doing this without, without getting to anything more complicated than doing a facet and editing it manually. Um, but there's a lot more things that we can do. Let's see uh, if I'm staying on track here. Okay. So the next thing that we can do on our columns is uh, do transforms. So uh, one thing that we noticed that I, uh, that I have here is you can see that there's these little uh, uh, percentage signs with a strange character in there. Does anyone see that in their data set? And you can see that there's a bunch of them throughout the, um, the set. Anyone have an idea what those are? Does anyone recognize those? Yeah, they're, well, what they are is they're weird characters that are represented on the web. Um, as, and so they're like, uh, they're web safe characters, but they're not, being, but they're not text. And so we want to get rid of those to just go back to it being text since this is a data set now. So let's get rid of those automatically. Um, and so if you go over to your, your column again and you click the column menu, and you're going to say edit cells, and then you're going to say transform. This is going to bring up a, uh, a little um, dialog box that allows us to run what they call the general refine expression language, which is a a sort of Java-esque um, language that was specifically designed for OpenRefine to be able to manipulate your data. And so if you see right now, the expression in there is value. And so value is like a variable that just means whatever happens to be in that box right now. And then we can add stuff to that. And so, or we can manipulate it in different ways. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna manipulate it um, with a built-in function to get rid of those web 
um, uh, escaped characters. So we're going to call, we're going to do func, or we're going to do value, and you're going to put a period, and then you're going to say un escape because these were web escaped characters, and then you're going to say uh, parentheses, uh, whatever that thing is called, uh, apostrophe or quote URL. And you know, there's no way that you would know that offhand, obviously, that how you would do this. But how you can find some like information about it like, right away is just by clicking this little help button on that dialog box. It has the full um, kind of description of all of the possible functions that you could use um, right here. And usually, you're not going to learn how to do things by looking through that help, but it will help you remind you how to do things. There's a lot of um, tutorials. And so this is just one kind of built-in function. Um, so it's value.unescape uh, URL. And so what that means is we're going to take the original value, so that's value, and then you're going to combine it with this function right here um, using that period, and this function unescape URL. Um, and so look at what the result is down here. It's giving you a preview. So we have this weird um, escaped uh, web character, and then over here, we're ending up with a, um, an E with an accent because that's what it was really representing, um, but it was on the web, so it had to be in a different kind of format. So let's just um, go ahead and nothing's happened yet. We've just played around with this. If you play around, you're gonna see that, like if I delete that, it's gonna say, oh, that doesn't work. It's a parsing error. error. So you can really just use this to play around and keep looking at this preview to see if what you're doing or what you're writing is doing what you think it will do. Once you're ready, you press OK. And there you go. So now we've just transformed 4,951 cells um, where we fixed that character encoding issue. Um, and now, if you look over in your facets, you're going to see we, know, we now have some nice E's with accents, um, and we don't have any weird um, percentage sign uh, characters. Does that make sense? So we could do lots of different things with transform. If you go to edit cells, transform. Um, we could just add random characters to it. String, to add a string is to say is plus. You put a, a quote sign, and you can just write some random thing. So uh, you can see in the preview, now we're taking whatever it was originally, Paris Universitas, and then we're adding random thing at the end of it. Uh, obviously, I want a, a space in there so that you can still read it. Um, and then, okay, I don't really want to do that, so let's just cancel out of there. This is also how you do find and replace in OpenRefine. So let's do a transform, and we're going to do the value, period. I'm going to say replace, uh, parentheses. I'm going to put a string in there with a quote sign. So um, let's say we want to replace Idaho quote. And then you're going to put a, a comma. And then you're going to put it what you want to replace it with. So we're going to change it to Ida home. And then you close that off with a uh, parentheses. And you can see there's no errors. And you can see there's a preview. And then if you go down here to one that actually has all of these ones, uh, Paris Universitas remains exactly the same. But if we go down here to Idaho State University, you're going to see that it's transformed to Idaho uh, State University. So that's how you do find and replace. And this is actually really powerful. You can do multiple ones in a row. So I can just go up here and add another. Um, And so now uh, you can see I'm doing multiple find and replaces in a row. And so Idaho State is now going to be transformed into Idaho Random University. So let's just cancel that. We don't really do that. But that's how you do find and replace. All right. Um, everybody hanging in there? Do we uh, know what we've done so far? OK. So these are really simple things, but you can imagine that you can do, start doing some really powerful things uh, when you start to learn that, uh, that language, the Grel. Um, but let's take a look at something uh, else that's really awesome about OpenRefine, and that's this tab right here, the undo, redo tab. So if you click on that, 
you're going to see that there's a record of everything that we've done so far. Um, and this is really great when you're doing kind of exploratory work on your data because you actually have a record of what you did. You, when you get to the end and you've done all these transformations, you're not like, oh, what was I doing? It's like, okay, it's right here. And you can actually um, extract all that information. And so here it is, if you click extract, they've put all of those operations into a JSON file. And this is kind of a, a way of having um, a record of what you did to get to the data set so that if, you know, for reproducibility and to explain what you did, it's right here. This is actually showing what you did to manipulate and transform that data. But it's also for um, being able to reuse a routine that you figured out for a certain type of data set that you're going to reuse multiple times. So um, is I going to do that right now? Mm. OK, we're going to come back to that in just a bit. But uh, just know that it exists. And know that you can step back and forth through this and see what happens. Um, so now we're going backwards in time. And then we can go backward, forward in time to get to where we were uh, at this point. And that tab is always there. Um, and it will continue to be there uh, if you reopen this project a second time. Um, not from this interface, but you can do it by extracting it and um, deleting that out. Um, that's why they have, when you look at this extract, uh, it gives you this option to unclick one of the, op the things. And if you unclick that, it just takes that out of the routine. And so that's kind of how you could step back through your undo history with only undoing a few things, not everything. But you're basically going to have to extract that and then reapply it, um, which is an extra step, but um, actually makes more sense in more complicated situations. Um, because everything's run successively, it couldn't really like undo something in the middle. So uh, that's kind of how it works. Uh, any other questions? We're good? OK, so let's do something. Um, let's repeat what we just did here with the facets. Um, and let's do it on the country. So we're going to hop over to the country uh, code. We're going to go to text facets. We can take a look at what's in there. And we can start seeing what's in this country uh, code. And so you can see that there's a bunch of junk in here. Um, we have Canada. Uh, we have 12,900 some from Canada. But we also have Canada and some area code. And we have Canada and some telephone in an area code. So we can fix those really quickly just by clicking on that facet and editing that out. So I did that. I'm going to apply that. I'm going to do it here too. OK, so now we have Canada as a value. But we actually have 13,484 because we just, had, we just got those um, 600 that were not being properly registered as Canada, and we made them into Canada just by that simple little um, uh, edit. Um, but we can do uh, some other things here that are really helpful. Almost always when you're working with text, you're going to want to do um, edit cells, transform, common transformations. And there, here's a bunch of transformations that people um, use over and over again very often. So we can do this unescape uh, HTML entities. And that should actually fix. Oh, it didn't fix. Uh, OK, we won't do that one. We're going to do common transformations, trim, leading, and trailing white space. Every time you work with text, pretty much um, it's a good idea to do this. Because um, in this case, we have zero cells transform. That means that there wasn't any weird white space. But in a lot of cases, there is weird white space. And white spaces are the bane of um, a data wrangler's existence. So this is a very handy and useful tool to just get rid of that white space and not worry about it. Um, now we can also um, sort with the facets. So you can see right here I have one facet where there's, uh, in the country, all we have is a, a comma. So let's click on that. And that's going to immediately take you to those, that bad data. And we can see what's going on. And so what we see is that it's, it looks like it's a Mexican university, and, um, but there's just nothing in the country code. So let's go ahead and just fix that um, right here while we're at it. So Mexico, again, I'm just editing that facet. And you can see it automatically changes um, those facets. And now I have actually six rows with Mexico. Because what I had originally was these two 
ones had just a comma um, that I was faceted on, and then I changed those commas to Mexico. Well, it turns out there's actually six universities from Mexico, so we've discovered um, a bit more here. Um, and so you can do that uh, here with the count. Let's say we just want to look at, um, we're going to go up here to reset. Uh, so right up in the top corner of your facet bin, there will be a reset if you have any facets currently in, uh, in play. So I'm going to click on United States. And so now when I clicked on United States, I'm only going to see the facets that include the value United States. So now I'm down to 32,000 rows uh, of our 75,000 that we started with. I can actually add some more. So I could add Canada now. Okay, so now I'm looking at the ones that have United States. Oh, wait, I, no, I didn't add it. Sorry. Uh, over here, uh, if you hover on the edge, you're going to see edit or include. We're actually going to click include. Now, I'm, now I have two facets selected. So now I'm seeing all of the um, data that has United States and Canada, or, 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 or Canada, really. Um, so you can easily subset this data. If you go over to export, which we'll cover in just a minute, when you have it filtered with these facets or with a text filter or any other thing that you're applying, when you export it, it's going to export that subset that you're working with rather than the full data set. So this is a really handy and useful way to subset your data, um, and I use that quite a lot. Um, so let's go ahead and do a reset again in that um, facet. And you can see right here we have our, um, our inconsistencies. We have USA, US, uh, U period, S period, et cetera. Um, and what we can do is let's just uh, edit that manually again. Okay, so I made a mistake in that, that's okay. So now you can see that's still not the same. So let's go over to this button that says cluster and click it. And so what cluster does is it actually runs um, text clustering algorithms and you can choose the different algorithms that you have um, available here. And it's going to suggest things that it thinks are the same um, based on the algorithm. So in this case, uh, it's it's seeing that US or US plus and then US U period S period are the same thing. Well, that's true. So let's actually go over to um, this new value cell. It says new cell value. You can put anything you want in there. It doesn't have to be one of the values that currently exists. So let's change that to the correct one, which would be. Um, United States of America, okay? And then I'm gonna merge it by clicking the button that says merge. Now I want to change all these other ones to that same thing as well because these are also United States. And so in this case, it's picked up two um, values that say United States, but one of them has a parentheses at the end, but those are obviously the same. So let's change those also to United States of America and merge. And then over here, it's got this, um, issue where uh, it says United States of America, and then this one has a, a capitalization that's different. And so we actually want to choose, um, we want to merge those, but let's choose the correctly spelled one. And you choose the one that you want it to match by clicking on it. Okay. And then there's also this visualization on the side so that you can um, kind of, when you have a cluster, when you have many, many, many clusters in a large data set, um, you could navigate through those depending on how big the clusters are and how many uh, rows are in them and things like that. So you just use these um, by pulling the bar back and forth. And so those in a lot of cases will become very useful. In this particular case, it's not. Now let's merge those by um, clicking the button at the bottom that says merge selected and recluster. And those clusters are now the same. Um, it changed them for us. Now we can choose a different clustering algorithm up here. So we can do an n-gram fingerprint. And each one of these has some different kind of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and basically, in this dropdown, they get fingerprint is very accurate, and then these ones are less and less accurate. Um, but they capture some other things. So you can take a look through those um, if, when you're trying to figure out your, um, uh, whoa. Sorry, I'm having some uh, screen sizing issues there. Okay, so that's clustering. Um, it wasn't particularly useful in this case, but it is incredibly useful in um, many cases. Uh, anyone have questions about clustering? So this is one of the best ways to really um, fix up your data set. Um, 
and get rid of all of those little errors and things that should be the same but aren't the same because there's an extra apostrophe, there's extra letter, um, there's an extra space. The clustering is going to pick that up, and it's a really powerful tool. Okay, uh, clustering and um, All right, now we're going to do a kind of funky thing. Um, one thing that you can do is just create new columns, split those columns, and mess around with those columns. So whenever I'm going to start doing something uh, drastic on a column, I usually just create a new column. So if you go back, let's go to university, and let's say uh, edit column and add column based on this column. If you click on that, uh, it's going to give you a dialog. You're going to put in a new name for it. So we're going to call it uni2. And then it has that uh, transform expression window again. So if you want to, you can transform it while we're doing this, creating a new column. So that's very useful in many cases. In this case, we're just going to leave it as it is and say OK. So now I have an exact copy of uh, university column right here as university2. And a lot of times I do that just to keep up on, check up on my work. So now I can do some weird transformations on university2. And I can always be sure that I, I what, you know, make sure I know what I'm doing um, if I'm getting unexpected results by comparing it back to the original. So now we're going to do um, something kind of fun. Doesn't necessarily make all that much sense uh, to this data set, but we're going to do it anyway. So I'm going to do a facet on here. And one of the things that you see um, a lot of is obviously majority of these uh, Universities are called university of something. So what if we could work on that last something? Um, because maybe there's some spelling errors in, not in the university of, but in that last word of that phrase, of that string. So what we want to do is uh, break this column into multiple columns. This is something that you're going to do a lot of times because, you know, a lot of times you'll have observations in your data set where they give like an hour and a day in the same, um, column, but you really want them into two places. Or they'll give uh, an author and a title in the same column, and you want them in two columns, so you can actually work on them separately. And so this is a very common operation that you do to get little things done. So we're going to split it into several columns. So we go to um, uni2, edit column, split into several columns, click on that. And it gives you a dialog box to show you, um, you know, what is the separator that is going to, that you want to split those columns on? So there has to be something that tells it that we need a new column. So in this case, there's just a uh, space because it's just university space of space something. So we got to put in that separator space. You can use regular expressions. You could use separators. Uh, and a lot of times there's multi-valued cells that have a uh, semicolon or something like that. And then we're going to limit it to having um, three columns max because it's going to be university of Something. Okay. But well, we're going to do it to everybody just because um, that's fine. Okay. So we're going to say, okay. Mine's running pretty slow, I think, because uh, are yours running faster than this? Okay. I think that Zoom is actually using up my um, CPU on this uh, computer. It's not super powerful. Okay, so now we have three columns in the place of the one column that we originally had. But like I said, what we really wanted to play with here was the columns where it said university of something. So what we want to do is actually go ahead and cluster it or uh, facet it by having that first column is going to have university. So click on uh, a facet on this uni2 one column. You're going you're gonna to get a text facet on it. And then you're going to click on university um, in there. So now you can see what we have is a bunch of columns where it says university. In the second column, it says of. And then in this third column, it says of something. So we can go ahead and we're going to just do a quick uh, common transformation. Let's uh, trim trailing and leading space just to make sure that that's good and it's good. Now let's go ahead and do a facet to see what's in there. Close this facet up and um, take a look over here. You can see the counts. We have um, anyway. So this is how you start exploring the data set. 
And we could go ahead and cluster this if we wanted to. I don't think anything was going to be found in this case. Okay, so you can see that this cluster starts to get more and more in inaccurate as we go. And obviously these are not the same values. Okay. Um, so, any questions about splitting columns? Or why you would want to do that? This is not a very good use case because it's not useful, but we're just doing it um, because it's, it is a very powerful and interesting feature that you're going to use a lot um, to get things done. Okay, so um, the tricky part is that if you want to put the columns back, you can't just do that um, uh, willy-nilly. So we're going to close all those uh, um, facets that we had open. And what you need to do to recombine it back in this direction is you're going to have to facet by blank. Because if I go to this first one and I say uh, transform, so I'm looking at that first column uh, of the column that we split up into pieces. And so what seems like you should be able to do is just say the value plus um, how you pull a value in from a different uh, neighboring cell from the same row is to um, we'll put a, a string with a space. We'll do a plus, and then we're going to do cells. You're going to put a bracket, and you're going to put in the name and a, a quote, and you're going to put in the name of the column that you want to grab it from. So it's uni two two, and a quote and a bracket and value. And so what you can see is that now what this little expression has done, we got value, which was the original thing that's in that column that we're working on right now. I've got a plus, which means add a string together. And then I've got a space in quotes, because I need to put space between these values that I'm going to combine. And then I have this little expression that says cells, and then it gives a column name, and then dot value. And so cells, column name, dot value means look across that row and grab it, grab the value out of um, the column that's named and put it into uh, this expression. So if you look down there, you're going to see that um, uh, we got Paris, and then it's transforming it into Paris Universitas because it's just grabbing the value in that next row over. And so we can go ahead and just say OK and see what happens. Um, and so it transformed all of the rows except for a couple of them. And let's do a facet, uh, customized facet, facet by blank. And none of them were blank, so we had no problems yet. Hmm, that's actually odd. Oh no, that is that does that does make sense. Okay, let's do a facet by blank over here too. That's a by blank. One thing to do is to continuously make sure that you're making sense. Um, okay, and if we do university three, customize facet facet by blank. Oop. So you can see it in our third column, there's a whole bunch of blanks. So um, if we want to pull this third column in, we don't want to um, pull all those blank values into this expression. And so what we want to do is um, on this third column, we want to facet by blank and we want to select false. Okay. So now we're looking at only um, 58,000 rows, and those are only the ones that actually have something in this column. So we could switch to true, and you can see that true means there's nothing in this column. So let's go back to the ones that say false. So there is something here, and we want to pull that back into, into this first column again. So we're going to do another edit cells, transform, value plus quote space, Plus, so I'm adding a space at the end. And then we're going to do this the same expression again. Cells. And then we're going to do uni two, three, quote, bracket. Oops, I didn't do the name of the column correctly. And value. Okay, and the preview looks correct. So again, what we're doing, we're taking that original value in that column. We're going to add a string, which is a uh, space, 
And then we're going to use this function called cells, giving, giving it the column name that we want to add, and then say that we want the value of those cells to be added as a string. And so that's a, that's a, a Grel expression again. It's gonna be a very common kind of thing that you wanna do if you're transforming things back and forth. Um, and you're gonna say, okay. And then you can go ahead and get rid of this facet over here. And so now what we have is this uh, uni2 is back to where it was before we split it into three columns. We've now reconstituted it as a single column. Okay, so let's clean that all up. We don't really need all these columns anymore because we did a bunch of work on it. So if you look at this last, this very first column in here, it says all. And so everything that you're going to do in that all column is for essentially functions that are going to affect the whole data set. And so this is really where you're going to work with rows, if you're going to work with rows. And so um, we're going to go to edit columns, all edit columns, and you're going to click reorder and remove columns. And it brings up this little um, uh, dialogue, and you can easily just change the order of things. So let's say we want the um, country is way down here. We actually want the country to be right next to the university. Just drag it up to the top. And then let's get rid of these extra columns that we added. So let's get rid of uni2, uni2, 2, uni2, 3. And I just drag them over to this side where it says remove them. So now I've done two things. I've reordered it, so it says university, then country, and then I've dragged off some columns that I don't want and stuck them over on this side. And then if I say okay, um, it just does it almost instantaneously. So that's a pretty big transformation that's really uh, powerful and easy to do, and it's just a way to clean up. And so this is kind of the, the way, the kind of routine that you're gonna work through a data set. You kind of create things, do a bunch of filtering to get to what you want, do some transformations on what you want, and then unfilter, and then get rid of the, the junk that you just created, and only saving the parts that you actually want. Um, okay. Right about an hour, let's check the chat. Uh, still no chat. We have some questions right now, guys. Anybody totally lost and or seeing some possibilities in Refine? All right, so let's get this out of Refine now. And so this is called exporting. Um, basically what we've gone through so far is um, just some really basic uh, kind of, uh, you know, introducing the, the features. So the features that you're gonna do is, one, thinking about that you're working up and down these columns, that you're gonna use facets, you're gonna use clustering, and um, then you're gonna use all to get rid of rows. Okay, now what we're gonna do, actually let's just move, remove a couple rows. Uh, I didn't um, do that earlier, I guess. So let's say, um, oh, we have a, we have a, a chat here. So how does uh, OpenRefine um, handle files with headers and there's lots of blank space? So you mean like blank lines in between um, the rows? Yeah. Okay, so that um, you're gonna have to deal with that mainly in the, um, when you're opening a project is the best way to do that. But um, because you're just gonna essentially change the options that are there um, when you're creating a project uh, to handle those formats. So that, that usually happens when you're going back and forth between Windows and um, Linux where um, they have different line endings and a lot of times it get, uh, Excel gets confused and then adds a whole bunch of extra white space. Um, and the way that Excel stores things, a lot of times that there's white spaces at the end that Linux or uh, other kinds of programs will interpret as an extra line. And so usually when you're opening the project, you can deal with that. But let's say you had a, you opened your project and there's all these extra blank lines. So what you'd end up doing is, um, we're gonna kind of do an example of that right now. So let's get rid of the data that, um, that is empty. So let's say, um, let's go over to, let's just say uh, what we're really interested in is the number of faculty. So let's go to number of faculty and let's say uh, text facet. So you can see it's a, a pretty junky um, column, but um, let's work with it anyway. So let's go to number of faculty, and then let's go to facet, customize facets, and facet by blank. 
Um, and then we're going to say true. So now what we have is uh, 18,880 rows that have blank in it. And so in a case where you have a data set where there's alternating lines that are full of, uh, that are just blank, you would come up with some um, row that you could, uh, that you could facet on blank and then remove them all. So what we're gonna do is we facet it on a blank. So what we're looking at right now is a subset of that data, that's 18,000 rows um, that are all blank in the number of faculty. And so let's say, um, let's get rid of all the row these rows because um, we don't want them. And so you go over to all, and you go to edit rows, and then remove all matching rows. Okay, so now um, because we have it currently faceted on number of faculty or number of faculty being blank, but now we got rid of them all. We're not seeing anything, so we got to reset this facet. And now what we have is a smaller data set um, that only has uh, uh, rows that actually had a value in that num number of faculty. So um, we've we've made a, a subset of the data, and a lot of times that's something that you just do right away, like because maybe if um, there isn't a measurement you're just gonna throw that out because it's not gonna be a recorded observation. Um, and yeah, you're gonna use that a lot of times when you're cleaning up, um, like you said, where there's character encoding issues, um, where you have extra rows that are blank. A lot of times when you're transferring in XML or JSON, you'll end up with a lot of blank rows. Um, and so just come up with a column where you can actually um, uh, facet it on blank and then remove those rows. Okay. Um, so let's export something out of Refine. If you go up to the corner, you're going to find the export menu. And the first option up there is export a project. That would be if you, that's actually going to um, export the Google Refine format, which is not useful for anything else except for Google Refine. Um, so if you're collaborating with somebody or you want to back your project up somewhere, um, that's what you would do. You export the project. Someone can, can open it in Open Refine, but that's the only thing you can do. Normally, you want to get out, get it out into a, a different, more standard format. So it has a bunch of standard formats available: tab uh, delimited, comma delimited, uh, an HTML table, Excel, um, um, XLS, uh, XLSX, or open document format. Um, so those are really, you know, what most people are going to use. But one of the really cool functions that it also allows you to do is called templating. So if you click on templating. Templating is the um, default for getting JSON, uh, creating JSON tables out of your, uh, or JSON files out of your table. And so you can see that um, what it's doing is it, it's giving us a template. Um, hold on for a second. I think I'm. Okay, sorry. It's kind of not actually fitting on my screen, which is odd. Okay, so it's giving you this template that it's going to um, stick all the data in. And so you start with a prefix. So this is anything you want at the beginning of your, your file. In this case, let's say I, I don't want anything up there, or I, I want to say um, uni data. It could be anything. Um, that default there is, is uh, for JSON. But the cool thing about templating is that you could make it into any kind of file that you want at all. Um, so I'm just going to delete this extra JSON stuff because I don't want it right now. And then you can start playing with this. And you can see how it's pulling in your data is using these little mustache templating language. And so you, you see that there's these double brackets. And then it has a little function here called JSONize. And then it says cells, university value, just kind of like what we we're using um, in the transform. And so what that cells, university value is, is on this row, you know, go in the university uh, column and give me the value and put it there. And so what we're going to do is I'm actually just going to remove this little function that says JSONize because we don't need that. I'm going to um, delete that side of the bracket. I can just delete all this stuff because I don't want it from JSON. Um, and so now I have this thing that says cell or uh, double bracket or braces. What do you call those? Braces? Yeah. Um, cells bracket university, which is the column name, uh, bracket dot value, uh, double brace. Okay, and then I can do the same thing here. I'm gonna do that with a country. I'm gonna get rid of this JSONize function. So that JSONize is just a function. I can delete that function out by just removing it. And then I'm just gonna delete all this other stuff. 
and maybe I'll put them on the same line. And then on the end of it, rather than that comma, I'm going to put period. OK, so then it's giving you a preview of what it's going to export. And so you can see that I've changed it from um, that data into basically like a narrative text file. I could, I could put in here, I could put in um, anything you want. So this is actually a really powerful feature for transforming data because you can create any kind of template that you want and fit it into there. Um, so you can use this for creating web pages. You can use it for doing pretty much uh, JSON as the main um, is the default use, but you can use it for creating a story from your data if you wanted to. Um, so let's cancel that. You don't need to do that. Um, let's uh, go ahead and export it as a CSV, comma separated. And you can see it just opens up a new file and you download the file in theory. Obviously, you're not going to the internet. It's just downloading, it's generating that file, and then it's being saved in your download folder. So let's export. Um, I need to move this to get rid of that. Any questions of getting your data out of OpenRefine? As I said before, the, the cool thing about this is we can go over here to this facet, and let's say um, we're interested in Canada. Let's facet to Canada. And now let's do an export, a CSV. And now what I've exported in that CSV is actually only that subset of the data. So I've just subset of the data and exported it, and that's super easy to do, um, a lot easier than most uh, ways to do that. And uh, okay, now um, let's look at how you can automate. I'm going to get rid of this uh, facet. Go over to your undo, redo. Click on the extract button here. And you're going to see it jumps up with a bunch of JSON on one side and the names of all of the uh, everything that you've done so far to your data set right there. So now if you just say uh, control C or um, uh, right click and copy, you can copy that. And you want to copy it into a plain text editor like Notepad or Notepad++ or um, te Text Wrangler or something. Um, you don't want to copy that into you know, Word because it'll mess up all of the quotes. Um, so copy that into some plain text editor right now. So uh, I did that. Then you can close that. Let's go over here to open. We're just going to open a new project and create a new project. And let's just practice this again. Um, let's open the university data that we opened the first time around. Create next. You get the preview. I'm going to change the name. Uh, University Dev 2. I'm going to create the project. Any questions about creating projects? We got this all down? All right. OK, so now I have a brand new project exactly the same as what we started with um, uh, an hour ago, half an hour ago. And I'm going to go over to this undo, redo. And there's a button right here that says apply. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to go back over to my text file that I just copied from my extract. I'm going to copy it all. And I'm just going to paste it in here. And then I'm going to click the little button that says perform operations. It's going to take a minute on my computer anyways. Um, and what it's going to do is it's just going to go step through that whole file and apply exactly the same um, set of operations that we did the first time around. Um, to the new file that we or the new project that we've created, and so um, a lot of times when you have uh, some kind of data processing stream um, pipeline where you're having a, a specific kind of uh, file coming in again and again, this is a really good way to automate that process or to do batches of them, um, where you've kind of figured some way of doing it out. You can store that and save it so that you can share that with your colleagues or um, apply it to new data sets as they come in. Uh, so now you can see it's done on mine. We're um, exactly where we were on um, this other one, uh, 56,158 rows. And um, so that's automation. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm just going to show you one other thing, I think, and then... Uh, we can just have a chat if anyone has more questions about anything. Um, so one uh, pretty neat function is that, 
Let's do a text facet on country. Um, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna choose Australia uh, just because it's a small. Actually, let's choose even the smaller one, uh, Bulgaria. Okay, so I have two rows right now that say Bulgaria. Um, one really cool uh, way that um, Google Refine can or Ref Open Refine can do stuff is um, by fetching um, things from a URL uh, from the web. So I'm going to create a new column um, based on that current column. And I'm going to grab the little recipe from over here. And what I'm going to do is actually uh, create a new URL, which is a, um, so I've got to delete that value, paste in that little thing that I grabbed off, that little recipe that I had, um, geo -loc. So I gave my column a name. I pasted in that little value that I got from the recipe over there. And what this is doing is it's creating a little URL that's going to point to um, the Google Maps um, uh, API, which is an open API that you can use. And so I'm going to say, okay. So now I have this new um, column that is little um, URLs, like they're little websites. They're, they're calls to the Google Maps API. And how I want to get the data from Google Maps into my table is I go to um, edit the column. And then there's this option, add the column by fetching URL. So I'm going to click that. And we're going to, um, so it gives you the option of throttle delay. That's how many seconds, milliseconds it's going to wait between each call. So if you're calling something, sometimes they have, uh, they'll block you if you call it too often. So you want, you have that option available. Um, and I'm just going to say, okay. And so Google Refine starts work, or Open Refine starts working on it. It actually called to Google's uh, geolocation service API, and it got some data back, which is in JSON, and it filled this column up with that data that it got back. So now I can actually parse this little bit of data, and you can see that in there is actually uh, latitude and longitude right here. So now I have a geolocation, um, and I could put this, I could go ahead and plot this data on a map. So uh, if you had more specific uh, locations, like uh, town and zip codes and things like that, it's a really powerful and really cool little feature. Um, and then you can actually use this whole uh, feature for doing web scraping of data um, or creating new data sets from the web. Uh, so it's a really neat and interesting feature. They also, um, you could uh, reconcile your values with a database or with an authority file. Um, so there's lots of ways you can call things from the outside into your data set. Um, to improve it, create more data, and um, uh, improve the quality and value of your data set. So um, I think that's what I'm going to present for today because it's getting a bit long. And um, I'm just going to ask for any questions that you guys have about anything, anything that I could help point out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So there's uh, a lot like with typing and stuff like that. There's a bunch of functions to do that. And so if like for us in this example data set, we'd want to start working on um, yeah, like the you know they're, they're supposed to be dollar numbers, right? And then but obviously they're not as dollar number, so we're not going to be able to do any visualization with it because there's all kinds of different versions of that dollar number. Um, so yeah, that's, that's exactly the sort of thing you might do. You'll say there's like functions that are like two number um, and you switch between being a string or being an actual number and then, um, then you can start doing uh, calculations on it and things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, that's definitely uh, something that would be common when you're working, when you're actually trying to get further in cleaning up this kind of data set. And be very common. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any uh, use cases that you guys are thinking about? Um, My whole PhD is already done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's, you know, um, there's so many ways that you can extend it. Um, you know, once you learn these transforms, there's the growl expression language, but you can actually also go ahead and um, use up here. You can see you can actually use Python or Clojure. Um, to 
you know, extend it even further. So sometimes there might be some really complicated thing that you want to do on a data set. And so I use it back and forth a lot of times. Um, it's just so much simpler than um, using Panda Python or uh, Pandas on Python for a lot of things. And especially when I want to see what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, if I do this, is this going to work? And then you come up with these kind of rhythmic routines of like creating a column and then faceting it and then marking them and then going back. And so there's this, this, this kind of nice flow to the way that you're working with the data um, once you get kind of used to thinking about it in that way in terms of um, you're working down columns and then you're trying to kind of filter what you want so you can transform it. Um, so it's, it's kind of an elegant little uh, application. So I've had a word for like Excel right after the students, essentially the same as forms that we get in the yeah, yeah, you could, um, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Um, one of the things is that a really cool function is, you know, I have two instances running right here, and I actually can do crosses between them. So let's say you had a big data set that was, that you want to essentially map into this new data set, and, but maybe it's not like all of the columns don't match. Um, you could actually do it in terms of a cross, just like you would do kind of like with a database. And so you would say there's a key column, like an identifier, and you would say, okay, this identifier on this one, this identifier on this one, find the ones where they match up and replace the values. And so that's a really cool function. So that's call, called cross in Grel, um, in Google, or in general refined language or whatever. Uh, and then the other way that you can do that is, yeah, you would have a routine that you would apply to the old ones to get them into the same format as the new ones. And then once you did that, you would just grab all of those files as one batch and open them together and then just export it as one batch. Um, so yeah, there's a number of different ways you can go about it depending on how complicated and how much time you want to spend on the individual mappings and things like that. Uh, but you know, those, yeah. I think that the strength of Refine is the visual and being able to do that um, in efficient ways. And so in some cases, with, if the mappings are things that are like, let's say they were all standard from 1800 to 1955, but then 1955 to, you know, they're different, then Python is gonna be better at doing that because it's, if it's really, really standard, you might just write a Python script to, to do a merge like that because you don't, you don't need to look at it. Um, but if you are like, well, some of them might be this, some of them might be that, and I need to filter a subset of them that are in a certain format and are gonna go into a certain set over here, um, so there might be two mappings in one data set, um, that's where Refine is gonna make your life a lot easier because you're gonna be able to look at it and make sure you're doing what you think you're doing. Um, and the subsetting part is like, I think really powerful once you start to see how that's gonna affect um, your manipulation. So um, one of the other things that you can do over here is uh, you can see on the far side in the all column, there's these stars and flags. So what you end up starting to do is you kind of build up like um, subsets, like I said. And so let's say uh, I have right now, I'm looking at Bulgaria and I want to um, star all the rows. Okay, so now I have kind of like a quality of those rows stored away. And I go back and I reset this here. And now let's say, let's say we want to subset to China. And then I want to star those rows. Okay. So now I go back to the full data set. I can actually go over here to facet by star. And you can see that I have those four that had starred. And so you can add up these little qualities that you want um, to get more and more complicated subsets. And so you can do stars, you can do flags, and then that allows you to do something like, what if I want, um, oh, I don't know. Yeah, this, sorry, this data's not clean enough to actually do like a numeric facet yet. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I could do a text filter like, um, starts with a, has a B, and then I also want it to be starred. Oh, it's Bulgaria, you know. So what are the, the uh, universities that have a B in them and are also starred because I starred Bulgaria and China. So this, this is that subset. Um, so there's lots of little um, ways that you can filter your data um, 
and in an intuitive kind of way and, and just discover new things about it. I also like it just for like when you have an unknown data set and you want to see what's in it because you can just very quickly, you know, get these um, text facets to see, you know, get a kind of way to look through it um, and, and just try to get a handle on what's in there. If, if you have a proper numeric, um, uh, Uh, so uh, the so a question is, um, aside from the number of rows, uh, what are the major limitations in your experience? Um, so there's things that it's really good at. Um, and one of them is not data entry. You're not going to use this like you would use Excel. A lot of people sit and type things in Excel. Obviously, you're never going to do that because it would be a pain. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve in terms of um, trying to figure out how to use these transforms. Um, and the other limitations, I guess, would be uh, just making sure that it's very powerful and so you can do weird things that you didn't realize you did. And so you'll have some kind of implications of something that you did and some transformations. So that's why it's really important to keep checking on, you know, doing your sanity checks on checking on the rows that you're getting expected results, looking at your previews, um, and making sure that you know what you're doing, or what you've done, and looking at your undos to make sure that you understand where you're at at any time. So uh, I don't think there's exact limitations per se, but just um, that it's really good at certain things. Um, and there's other cases where you're gonna be better off doing a scripting language like Python, like we've already kind of discussed. And there's other cases, uh, mainly for data entry where you might use Excel. I'm pretty anti-Excel in general, but um, I know that people use it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, anything else guys? I don't want to uh, take any more of your time if you're, uh, if you're ready. But uh, if you have any questions about Refine, um, just always uh, come and let me know. And because uh, I really like playing around with it, uh, I have a web scraping example on here. Um, we got one more chat. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, there's check out the resources page on the little website here because there's lots and lots of tutorials out there, um, lots of reference, and pretty much if you just search for things, um, there's a lot of help out there. And there's an open, there's a Google group so you can post your questions on there and people will answer it pretty quickly. And also we have this using Open Refined book in the library um, as an ebook if you want to take that out. But I just put in a number of different little uh, tutorials that are from different kinds of points of view using different kinds of data sets so you can kind of see um, the range. Uh, and there's also specialized versions of Refine for different disciplines as well. So there's like a bio kind of one. And so uh, there's a lot more to explore than, you know, what we've gotten to here. But I think, you know, the best way to do it is to actually try to, you know, you know I tried to give you kind of an idea of what it can do so that you have a use case, then try to use it and see what you do, what you can find. And when you have a problem, just email me and um, we can uh, chat about it. Because I, I, like I said, I really like playing around with Refine and I have a good time with it. Um, and it's uh, I think it's a really good tool. So thanks a lot for coming and uh, hope to see you in the future. Thanks.